I call uh, Kevin Haig. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I think, as, as members know, I'll be leaving this House in a couple of weeks' time, and um, I'd like to thank very much the Honourable Annette King for her kind words in, in, in the debate. Um, and also, also thank um, Pesita uh, Sam Lutuinga, the, the, the Minister, for, um, for doing me the favour of bringing this bill back so that I could speak on it one last time before I go. It's, it's, it's great to be able to see this bill enacted um, before, before I leave. Mr Speaker, it also gives me one last chance to uh, give the House a bit of a lecture on health promotion. So, you know, I, 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 I can't resist the temptation. Um, the, fundamental thing, the fundamental thing about health promotion is the understanding that uh, people do not change their behaviour because of information, by and large. So the idea that, um, that a homo economicus, the rational economic decision maker, will translate Adam Smith's 1776 theory into their health behaviour and weigh up the pros and cons of different behavioural choices and thereby uh, choose, the, choose the option um, that's, go, that's going to produce the best health results is just nonsense. It doesn't happen that way. And if you think about, um, not you, Mr Speaker, but if one thinks about uh, uh, the processes of, um, of choosing food or uh, smoking, as in this case, alcohol, sexual behaviour, these are not, in fact, rational choices. And so imagining that we can change people's behaviour by giving them better information is fooling ourselves. It turns out, Mr Speaker, that the things that do actually work are to empower those communities that are most affected by health problems. And those communities will tend to be most affected not only by one particular health problem, but by every health problem. There is a clustering of health problems in particular communities who are marginalised. And as it happens, um, those same communities will partic be particularly adversely affected by problems in education or justice or social development. So empowering communities to design and implement their own interventions is one of the fundamental things that we can do. And the second thing that we can do, and this applies particularly to this House, to Parliament, to the Government, is that we must create supportive environments around those communities through legislation and public policy and social and physical environments, through economic environments. That, that is the formula. And as Ian Lee Scalloway has said, in this bill we're dealing with standardised packaging. We are removing the last opportunity that tobacco's had, tobacco companies had to market and advertise their products through visual means using the very packets that their products came in. So, Mr Speaker, this is an intervention that is about creating an environment that is more supportive of, health, of good health outcomes. Uh, Mr Speaker, other, um, other speakers in this debate have talked a little bit about the history of this country, of Aotearoa, being a leader in tobacco control public policy. And it's a, it's a legacy that, um, that political figures from several parties actually have the right to feel proud of. Um, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, for example. The Honourable Annette King. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Stevie Chadwick was, was mentioned, uh, and that, appropriately so. Um, the Honourable Tariana Turia. Hone Harawera. Tauhenare. And actually, I, I want to um, also praise uh, Paul Hutchison, um, you know, who has uh, had a history of crossing the floor of the House to support sensible tobacco control measures. That was a brave thing for him to do. Um, but I, I wonder now, Mr Speaker, after all the delay in this bill, whether the, the, the delay was caused not so much by the government being uh, scared of being uh, sued by tobacco companies, as the government said at the time, 
uh, using ISDS provisions and, and going through proxies in, in the WTO, but whether rather it's actually um, not, uh, not being prepared to be leaders anymore. Like, the, like the, the kid in the classroom that doesn't want to be the first to put their hand up. And actually, we've seen this in other areas of public policy as well, where our country has moved from being a leader or even, even a fast follower to become a slow follower, a laggard internationally. And, and Mr Speaker, that's, that's a change that I regret. In that, in that fine tradition of leadership, I wonder where um, the Honourable Peseta Sam Lotuenga is going to rank. And, and, and Minister, I, I urge that you step up um, to that leadership role. Because the goal of uh, smoke-free Aotearoa 2025 um, is a laudable and necessary goal. And we've just heard Barbara Kuriga, in fact, from the government side, eloquently making the case for urgency in tobacco control, for a comprehensive suite of measures. And yet we've actually had a government that has said no to many of the, of the measures that could have taken us there. And, and we've had a government that has dragged their heels on this bill, on this measure, that actually had a really important contribution to make. So, so Minister, I hope that you will be the person who will lead us in that comprehensive plan um, for tobacco control and to achieve smoke-free Aotearoa, because right now we are not on track for doing so. That plan has got to include things like smoke-free cars, like smoke-free parks, um, like licensing retailers of tobacco products. Uh, it's got to include the public health advocacy. And it was interesting to hear Simon O'Connor um, praising the public health advocates that he's been hearing about in relation to this bill, because the government has chosen to cease the funding of most of those public health advocacy organisations. The people that Simon O'Connor has been hearing from probably don't have jobs anymore, Mr Speaker. Um, and the plan also needs a massive injection of funding into, into quitting services. And I look forward to seeing that from the government. And Mr Speaker, to do that, to show leadership in achieving smoke-free Aotearoa 2025, will require considerable courage. In the submissions that the Select Committee heard, the, those from the tobacco companies themselves and from their proxies were notable because they illustrated a strategy that the tobacco industry has followed uh, since uh, the 1950s when Dole and Hill first conclusively showed the link between tobacco consumption and lung cancer. First of all, tobacco companies denied that such a, such a link existed. Then they, they tried to uh, throw into the mix their own research to add confusion to the picture. We actually see the sugar industry following precisely that path now. And we see the, the oil and fossil fuel industries doing the same on climate change. They are following the game plan of the tobacco industry. And right now, the tobacco industry has got to the point where the phase of their strategy they are pursuing is delay. And so that is what sits behind the delay that we have seen on this bill. And the tobacco industry, who have opposed every single um, measure intended to curb tobacco-related harm in this country, they will do the same on all of those other measures intended to reach smoke-free Aotearoa 2025. And it will require leadership and courage from the government to stand up to those tobacco companies. Does the government have that? I wonder. Speaker. Barbara Stewart.